Hi folks, welcome to the Moving Beyond Being Good podcast by Gary Ryan from Organisations That Matter. In this podcast, Gary shares everything about servant leadership, service leadership, authentic leadership, how to create high performance cultures, service excellence and life balance. Here's your host, Gary Ryan. Thank you, Sienna, for your lovely introduction. And folks, I'm absolutely delighted to be here with Martin G. Moore. Marty, as he prefers to be known by everyone, we'll just give him a quick introduction. Uh, He is the no bullshit leader. Uh, He isn't a theorist. Everything Marty's learned has been through his personal experience and performance in the trenches. He calls himself a university dropout, but he actually does have an MBA that he got a few years later. Um, and I think he says on LinkedIn that uh, he was it was an absolute disaster, his uh, undergrad days as a university law student. However, he did work his way up to whole corporate executive roles in strategy, technology, finance, sales, and marketing. So quite a broad suite of uh, roles there, folks. And certainly as CEO of the multi-billion dollar company CS Energy, he drove a remarkable performance turnaround, growing EBITDA from $17 million to $441 million uh, in just five years, which is a 125% compound annual growth in earnings, and that's virtually unheard of. Uh, in 2018, he left the corporate world to create the Your CEO Mentor, and we'll We'll talk about that journey here today, and uh, it's a business he founded with his daughter, Emma Green, and since then, his direct cut-through approach has made the No Bullshit Leadership one of the top leadership podcasts globally. It's one of the podcasts that I certainly tune into uh, twice a week, uh, as you'll hear today, and that's had over 4 million downloads, folks, which is just extraordinary in over 150 plus countries, uh, and his book, no Bullshit Leadership uh, debuted on at number two on the Wall Street Journal. And his sole purpose, which is really the reason why we're here today, is to improve the quality of leaderships globally. Uh, Marty, welcome and thanks for spending some time with us today. Thanks, Gary. You've still got time to talk to me after that introduction. <laughs> yeah. Well, it's, it's, it's all got to be told because uh, okay. there's still maybe some folk out there that don't know who you are. So I'm glad to be able to... <laughs> introduce you to my audience. Now, um, I, I am interested to know what you think about leadership and its current state uh, at the moment, because that, that global perspective that your your sole purpose is about enhancing it. So what do you think about where we're at with lead, leadership globally at the moment? Well, Gary, I think in uh, a lot of the jurisdictions I operate in, I see that leadership has become uh, very weak. And when I say weak, it's been a general degradation over time for all the right reasons. And I think the last 10 or 15 years of uh, leadership content in the public domain has really been about desirable leadership attributes. Leaders need to be humble and authentic and fallible and transparent and so forth. And there's absolutely nothing wrong with that. In fact, those are incredibly desirable characteristics. However, I think we've lost touch with the primary function of leadership which is to get results and create value for the person who's paying your wages. And I think leaders should bring that back into central focus. I'm here to get results, I'm here to get outcomes. And if you do it the right way, if you're a strong leader who has boundless empathy, you can do this in a way that will also be the best thing that the people who work for you will ever experience. And they'll have high impact, they will have high self-esteem, and they'll love what they do. And I think the trouble with focusing on the other attributes of, uh, let's say, fallibility, is that you focus on that and you don't focus on your people. You focus on what you're trying to do yourself. Mm. And when you take the focus away from your people and just put it on yourself, uh, it can be quite dangerous and you can become quite a weak and permissive leader letting your people run the show. Yeah, that's one of the things that I've certainly picked up through all of your work, through your podcast and through your book, Marty, is that you really do focus on enabling others to do their job so that you as the most senior leader, certainly when you're as a CEO and you in your role as a CEO mentor, you're definitely uh, coaching and teaching people to do this, is that it's actually about them, uh, that your leadership's about them. But you talked about it needs, you need to be both strong and empathetic, which for some folk is two ends of the spectrum. Tell me a little bit more about how you think those two actually come together? Well, listen, I can give those examples around humility and fallibility and some of the other things we're talking about, but let's just stay with empathy for the moment. Um, empathy, in its purest form, is just the ability to see the world through someone else's eyes, mm. to be able to understand their perspective and understand how they see things. And that is an incredible skill to have. So I'm from the camp of there's no such thing as too much um, uh, empathy, there's no such thing as too highly developed an EQ. As long as you are strong enough to not let that affect 
doing the right thing, making the right decisions, and still retaining focus on the primary imperative, which is to deliver value and to do the best thing you can for your organisation. The trouble is that when empathy is put in the hands of weak leaders, that morphs into sympathy. And sympathy is uh, disastrous every single time. If you become sympathetic for the people you lead, you'll make the wrong decisions for the wrong reasons. It's not good for them, it's not good for you, it's not good for the team. So I, I think that balance of, you know, what else is going on? And we can talk about this because we oversimplify everything. And so mm -hmm. when we talk about humility, you know, well, you know, leaders have to be humble. And I've seen articles on LinkedIn that say, you know, only hire humble people. So if you're humble and you're also decisive, then that can be incredibly powerful. It's like rocket fuel. But if you're yes. humble and you're indecisive, it's disastrous. No one's going to follow you. Yeah. You've been talking about decision making and, and, you know, the chapter that you wrote in your book, No Bullshit Leadership on decision making, I've, I've announced publicly uh, that if I was to ever write a chapter, I think you 100% nailed it. I don't need to write that chapter because you already did it. And I certainly see my client base, Marty, um, a real challenge around decision making for leaders. I don't know if it's a post pandemic issue when everyone got separated and, and we haven't been in the office and culture's been such a challenging thing to do. But this idea that there's the democratic approach to decision making seems to have crept in. And one of the things that you sort of talk about with regard to decision making is one issue, one person, one decision. Uh, would you like to tell us a little bit more about that for folk that might not have heard your, your perspective on decision making? Oh, for sure, Gary. And, and, and look, I think that uh, I found this happening way before the pandemic. And it may have been accelerated or it may be exacerbated now. But I've certainly seen this over many years. And depending on the culture, it really is a cultural thing. Uh, we want everyone to have their say. And I think this comes along with the new age leadership of, you know, you're there to give people their best lives and help them to develop and, and become whatever they want to become themselves. Once again, nothing wrong with that. But when you bring it down to its lowest common denominator, this is where your decisions end up. So decision making by consensus and management by committee. Mm. Too many people in every decision, too much time spent pandering to people's you know, views, opinions and so forth less data on the table because the people who are expert aren't the only ones who are giving input. It's people who are not expert who feel as though they want to have a say. It breeds things like power of veto, where you can have, I've, I've seen this, you know, mm. 18 engineers in the room, 17 say, we agree that's a good idea. And one who just happens to be an opinion leader says, you know, I'm not so sure. I want to go away and think about it. And so this operates like an effective power of veto. Yes. And the trouble with a consensus decision is that it drops you, as I said, to the lowest common denominator. You have to cater to everyone's individual opinions. You have to give each person a win so that they feel as though they've been included. And what you end up with is the Frankenstein's monster of decisions, right? It's a decision that everyone can live with, no one's really happy with, and you wouldn't be able to find a person who actually says that's the right decision. They can yes. say, you, you've made a concession to let my little bit in here, but I still don't think it's right. And so those are the worst decisions. And, and we think that a consensus decision is actually a good one, but it's not. And what it does is it completely erodes the concept of single point accountability. Yes. This is probably the most critical aspect of this, is that if you're gonna make someone accountable for an outcome, they have to have the ability, the empowerment and the support to actually achieve that outcome on their own merits. And to do yes. that, they've gotta be able to make the decisions that affect that, that particular deliverable. So if you've got someone who's accountable, but then you make them beholden to 20 other people who all feel as though they want to have a say when they don't have any accountability at all, it's all care, no responsibility, you just end up in a shit place. That's all it yes. is. Yeah, and look, again, I'm, I'm seeing that with a lot of my client base and, and trying to teach the leaders that one of the things they've got to do is increase clarity. Right, so they've got to increase role clarity. If you want people to be responsible and accountable, they need to know what their role is. They need to be able to say out loud what they're responsible for. They need to know what a great job for each of those responsibilities look like. And they need to be clear about what decisions they're meant to make that they're going to be held to account for, okay? Now that doesn't mean, you know, you, you, you did mention, mention um, consensus. It doesn't mean that you can't be working with people to understand where they're at, but ultimately you've still got to make the decision. And, and I, my, my take on your work, on your body of work, is that's what the strong part is. Um, one of the things that I'm an advocate for is servant leadership, as you're aware of. And, and one of the 10 characteristics that Robert K. Greenleaf initially 
um, authored when he wrote the essay back in 1971 was around foresight. And I find a lot of people don't understand what he meant by foresight. And basically what he meant was is that if you've got a vision of the future that you're striving to create, and today you can see some actions that you need to make some decisions on to enable you today to take the steps you need to make to get there, then you need to make those decisions. Interestingly, he says that foresight is nearly always unpopular. Totally, totally. Yeah. Right. Yeah. It's unpopular. Sure. He actually went on to say that a lack of foresight is an un, is an ethical failure of leadership. Absolutely. Absolutely. And I, I, I certainly support that. I think I think that's exactly right. And, and you know, you're paid to do a job like as, as you go up through the hierarchy, you're paid more money to take on more accountability at a greater breadth and to make the decisions that are important with your perspective and your experience. And so drawing on the people around you is absolutely vital if you want to make a good decision. And of course, in my um, eight point, you know, what makes a great decision frame, one of them is you've consulted appropriately with the expert people. You know, you, you, yes. you can't bypass that step. And even though accountability at a single point should always override collaboration, it doesn't mean that the need to collaborate is completely obviated or that you, you know, are excused from talking to anyone else and just going rogue and doing things unilaterally. It doesn't work that way. That's going to be no. just as bad a decision. So if you combine all these elements together, it gives you back one of the most critical elements of decision making, which is speed. And we yes. underestimate and underrate the value of speed in the decision making process. But I see so many companies and so many teams just freeze. They just don't yes. go anywhere because of the ambiguity of the environment, because of their need to go through endless rounds of consultation that are just soul destroying. And everyone feels this. It just sucks everyone down to this vortex. Yeah. Look, I'm seeing that a lot in the not-for-profit sector in particular, which is really fascinating because they really don't have the financial resources to waste time. And they don't have the financial resources, nor often the people to waste time either, yet they go in so many circles not taking advantage of opportunities. And this idea of not-for-profit doesn't mean you can't be not-for-surplus. <laughs> absolutely. Absolutely true. Yeah. yeah. Which, I, which actually... I mean, you go, sorry. I, I, take a, I take a very interesting spin on um, not-for-profit activity. And um, I, I think when I talk about, you know, the centre of everything has to be value delivery, it yes. doesn't matter whether it's a not-for-profit or a, a government organisation or an NGO or a, you know, Fortune 100 company. This is still the principle. And value in a not-for-profit is basically serving the people in the communities that you're there to serve. I did a keynote for um, a very close colleague of mine who's global chief executive of... Uh, one of the one of the major charities, and he asked me to do a virtual keynote for his uh, country CEOs, which I did. And mm -hmm. basically, what I said was, if you don't believe that value is at the centre of these things, let me break it down for you. If you are not as efficient as you possibly can be, if you don't operate as quickly as you can with a sense of momentum and speed, you are robbing your potential customers of mm. your service. So let's say you can, and I've, I've sort of got to give the context here, uh, you know, providing a wish for terminally ill children. Yes. Okay, so let's say, let's say that your country has the funding and the opportunity and the wherewithal to do that for 500 people. If you can make yourself 10% more efficient, there's another 50 that will get the access to and the benefit from your service. You have an absolute moral obligation to have that efficiency and to build that into your organisation. Don't, don't think we're a not-for-profit, we don't need to be efficient. That is complete bullshit. Yeah, yeah. And, and they've, they've really got an ethical obligation in that instance for those 50 extra children to be able to deliver on that wish, if they can. I mean, Absolutely. that's what they're there for, 100%. Absolutely. Um, now, the term bullshit, uh, do you know how many times you say it in your book? Uh, well, it depends. Less than 100, probably. More than 10. <laughs> but, um, but don't forget that on the heading of every second page it says no bullshit leadership because that's the name of the book so if you take uh, if you take those out where there's uh i don't know 260 pages or something so you're looking at 130 there so i don't know maybe 100 
Well, you got me there because uh, uh, you know when I did my little search on Kindle, it's, it only came up with thirty. But of course, it is on the on the header of every second page, so it didn't count that for some reason. Yes, and you would have found the thirty where I actually spelled bullshit out fully, as opposed to putting the exclamation mark in there. Correct. Yes. Yeah. So, so given that you're based in the USA, I mean, despite what we see in the movies and despite what we see on YouTube, I, uh, my twin brother lives in Florida and has been there for twenty five years. So we get to the states quite a bit over time. I find as a population, they really don't cuss that much. So how, how have they taken to the term bullshit? Well, it's sort of weird. I'm glad you asked this, Gary. It's a very, very interesting cultural dynamic because um, you can see the US is very, very strong on uh, free speech, uh, individual focus as opposed to community focus. I think that's probably the one thing that distinguishes the US most from Australia, mm. uh, which you, you've probably seen yourself. When it comes to the word bullshit, it's funny because you've got guys like Gary Vaynerchuk, who every second word is an F-bomb, which is yes. fine, but there are still corporates out there that are very gun shy about this. Yes. So for the most part, you know, I'll, I'll go and speak at um, uh, at you know a conference. Uh, the conference organizer, I always ask in the pre-call, you know, do you have any problems with the word shit? Because let's face it, I am the no bullshit leader. Just go onto my website. The very first <laughs> thing there is blazoned across the top, the no bullshit leader. Right. So yeah, I can't sort of get away from it, and we've. <laughs> In fact, even doubled down in the last probably six months or so with that because that's my differentiator. Yes. So to, to make like a really short answer long, forgive me for this, but the first, the first thing is, yes, there is still an element of people being gun shy and particularly when it's large corporates because they go, all we need is one person to complain to HR and we've got a situation which we have to do yes. and we don't want that. And a lot of what they do is risk mitigation. You know, well, you know, we just don't want any waves, you know, so, mm. so some of that plays in. Personally, and Emma and I talk about this frequently, uh, we believe that this is just a good filter to have up front. If people can't handle the word bullshit, then there's no way they're going to be able to handle the directness and the hard hitting cut through of the messages that I give in my leadership content. So it's yes. almost like this awesome filter up front so that you're not mucking around with non-genuine people who aren't your audience anyway. So we have a very, very clear target audience and they're people who actually want to hear the truth. They're not people who want to you know, play the general pantomime of corporate leadership. Um, but yes. I, will, I will just say on a funny note on the end, everyone says to me, that word sounds so much better with an Australian accent. <laughs> yes, it does. Yes, it does. I think... My, my swear words sound better, better coming out of an Aussie accent, to be brutally honest. <laughs> as, as I say, I, I swear like a drunken sailor even compared to my, you know, Aussie compatriots. So, you know, hey, how, how, I, how I managed to get through a keynote and only say bullshit three times is quite miraculous, I think. <laughs> yeah. So, so that leads me to where, where did you get to formulate your ideas around leadership? Like, how did that happen? Because not everyone's as clear as you are. No, and I think that's probably, um, for a start, that's probably one of my superpowers uh, that I've found over the years is to be able to cut through a whole lot of noise and mm -hmm. find out what the most relevant, the most important and the most uh, salient pieces of information are in a world full of noise and a sea full of information. So in terms of pattern recognition and sense making, that's really one of my skills. And I can take the most complex of concepts or environments and break it down into its fundamental elements. Uh, and as my, as my mentor over here, Dr. Nick Morgan says, you have to break it down to its simplest form, but no simpler. And so mm. there, there, is, there is an art to that. And I, you know, yes. I'm constantly checking myself to make sure I do that. Um, so having said that, I think uh, I was lucky to have the leadership upbringing I had. When I went into my first leadership roles, I was absolutely disastrous because I was so arrogant and I was trying to prove myself and it was all about me. And mm. so I, I did that for a number of years before I worked out that it just wasn't effective. It wasn't that I suddenly had this blinding moral flash of the fact that, you know, I, was, I wasn't leading my people well. It was just through sheer realisation of, hang on a minute, I, I should be getting more out of this team. Like, what, why am I only producing amount X when I should be amount, producing amount 5X? Coupled with the fact that, you know, coming from an IT background, I managed to do the tour of different industries and different job families. So as you said in the introduction, you know, like, you know, finance, IT, marketing, sales, uh, you know, uh, strategy. And I also went through a number of industries, mining, insurance, energy, 
transportation. So, you know, I'd done the tour and what I realized was because I wasn't particularly skilled in anything in, in the sort of deep way that you see executives who come through an industry, I had to de get better at getting results through other people. I had yes. no other choice. Mm. And I would walk into an organization. My, my job at CS Energy was my first CEO job and it was in a company that I'd never been in the industry before. Mm. So I'm, I'm walking and learning the industry and I've got guys reporting to me who are like, they, they are the hot ticket in their particular field, right? These guys know, you know, the complexities of the energy market trading platform in Australia, which is, a, you know, an incredibly mind bending complexity. Uh, and they knew it like the back of their hand. And so when I walked in, they're looking at me as if to go, you know, and you're here, why? Uh, which is fair enough, right? And I like to say, you know, you want a team where on any given day, at least half of your direct reports think they can do your job better than you. Like that's the, yes. sort, of, that's the sort of team you're trying to build, right? But, um, but I, I just say to them, and, and part of this is having the confidence to say it and to know that uh, with my general skills around, you know, business and commercial acumen, negotiation, communication, uh, you know, risk management, investment um, uh, analysis and so forth, with those generic skills, I was really going to bring something that companies needed. So, so it was a case of, okay, you guys, you guys are expert in your fields and I need you. Like, you know I need you because I know, like, when it comes to this industry, I don't know shit from strawberry jam. So <laughs> I'm, going to, I'm going to be relying on you heavily to teach me in that first six months so that I can get a working operating knowledge of this business. But while you're doing that, you might just want to have a look at what I do because the board's brought me in for a reason. And they obviously think there's some stuff that I can do that you guys can't, which is why I'm in this seat. So you help me out. I'll be very respectful and learn from you as much as I can. I'll suck up from, from you like a sponge. In the meantime, you just have a look and see if there's something I do different that's going to get us better results. Yes. So, so that's, that's a combination. Yeah. I'm hearing that, Marty, is a combination of, of humility to go, I don't really know this game. You know it better than me. But strength on the other side is I actually know what I'm good at and – you, you, you know, you need to be aware that that's, that's here, it's present, I've been hired for a reason. It really is that combination of those two attributes sticking together. Yeah, yes, it is. And, um, you know, I just, um, I just wrote a pitch the other day for an article I'm writing for a magazine about um, uh, the concepts of confidence, arrogance and self-doubt. Yes. And, and you hear a lot of stuff these days about imposter syndrome with the expectation that, you know, well, we all feel imposter syndrome. Don't worry about it, push it aside. It's nothing to worry about, be confident and go forward. But in my view, these self-doubts that come up are absolutely critical in self-regulation and awareness. And so I like to say, you know, when you get these self-doubts, hey, listen to them. You've got to be mm. confident and you've got to have the confidence in your own capability and what you're doing and, and the path you're taking. But if you stop listening to your doubts, this is when confidence goes into overconfidence, which then goes into arrogance. Yeah. And so, and so the, the relationship between confidence, arrogance and self-doubt is actually a really tricky balance, but it's a really important one to think through the right way. Yeah. Yeah. A lot of what you've been talking about are continuums rather than either ors. Oh, for sure. And, and, and yeah, and that's that's a big differentiator that I think for, for whatever reason, folk out there at the moment see the world black and white. I don't know if it's because of liking and disliking. <laughs> on, on, I don't know if that's the catalyst, Marty, but... Most of life is, in fact, a continuum, as you've been describing, and it's about finding that balance within that continuum and, and building your understanding over time. Now, earlier you mentioned that you have a mentor yourself. You are the CEO mentor. How long have you been seeking mentorship yourself through your journey, Marty? Oh, well, always. I've, I've always sought out mentors, if not formally, and they're not always formal arrangements. No. But it's knowing that you have people in your life and in your, in your sphere, who you can call upon for their guidance at critical points. And when I was in executive roles, I would have had two or three mentors yeah. in different areas at any given point in time. So there's one guy who was just my mentor in industrial relations. You know, yes. I'm, I'm good at a lot of things. I'm, I'm shit at industrial relations, right? I don't have the patience for it. And I, yeah. find, I find the behaviors that go around that so distasteful that it really pushes my uh, my, my ability to be calm and composed. And so I mm. know that that's not where I'm at my best. And so quite often I would call this colleague of mine and say, hey, mate, can we just go and grab a lunch? Let me take your lunch. We'll go down to the Brisbane Club. Let's sit down. I just need you to talk me through a particular issue. What, what are these guys actually trying to achieve here? 
And I would get this inside scoop from someone who'd grown up, you know, on the waterfront in a, in a, a highly unionized environment and then had transitioned through to executive management and was part of the waterfront reform in the late 90s. So, so this was a guy who'd seen everything, knew every trick in the book, and the way he explained it to me gave me a lot more confidence that when I was making decisions, they might actually be the right ones. So yes, yes. I've, had, I've had mentors in industrial relations, in complex commercial matters, particularly when it comes to you know, mergers and acquisitions and things like that, where I don't have a huge amount of direct experience. Um, but these days, I've got mentors in speaking, in writing, in a whole bunch of stuff. And Emma, my daughter and the CEO of our business, she's my mentor in terms of all things digital marketing and social yes. media and everything else. I, I learn an enormous amount from her and, and Tash, who runs our marketing team, every, every week. You know, the things they do, and I'll question something, they'll go, well, we're doing this for this reason. I go, okay, great, thanks, I understand. And uh, yes. I couldn't do what I do. I wouldn't be out there. No one would be downloading my podcast if they can't find it. No. Well, uh, well, Emma's certainly done a terrific job getting over 4 million downloads and 150 plus companies. Now, I would like to just inquire a little bit about that transition from being the CEO of CS Energy to becoming the CEO mentor and working with your daughter, which is a great arrangement, no doubt, uh, with her being the CEO. How, how did, how, what were some key insights, one or two key ins insights about that transition, Marty? I think the transition was a revelation for me in a number of ways, Gary. I think the first one was, and, and yeah, most of it was quite expected. Um, I expected that it would be hard now that I couldn't just see a problem and say, let's get a team of analysts together to have a look at that, you know, or, or can you bring the legal team in to get some advice on this, right? That, that, that sort of disappears when you don't have those resources. So I expected that. A couple of things I didn't expect. Mm. Emma, Emma herself was a revelation to me. I knew she was smart. I trusted her implicitly, of course. You know, we, we know each other very, very well. But in terms of her work ethic, her drive, her passion, her commitment, and her ability to do pretty much anything. Uh, you know, yes. I, I had a bunch of budget in the first year for developing a website. She's gone, we're not spending that. And I've gone, what do you mean? <laughs> she said, well, I, I can do that. I'll, I'll learn how to build a website. So she taught herself Squarespace and Canva and built our first website, which we're still using to this day in the wow. corporate website. So her, her ability to do virtually anything actually surprised me. It took me by surprise, even though I knew she was good. Um, the other thing that, that I think took me by surprise is that when I was in the corporate world, oh my God, Gary, I used to think I was so good. I used to be able to go from these really complex, deeply complex issues and just bounce between them in a day. I could do a meeting with, you know, on a, on a super complex commercial issue. Then I'm negotiating with a joint venture partner. Then I'm sitting in a board meeting talking about, you know, compliance activity. Like, I was so impressed with myself. It was hilarious, <laughs> right? I used to think, oh my God, I'm so good. I can just whip between these things. My mental capacity is unbelievable. Well, I realized when I started my own business that it's the most inefficient way to work. And yes. I, I realized the, the power of being able to focus to the point where you can actually get into a flow state. And, and, yes. and you just see the hours pass while you were so engrossed in something, the continuity is so good, and the pro, uh, production and productivity is out of this world. And so that was another interesting learning, because I thought I was still going to be the bounce around to every complex issue I could find guy. And when I realized the power of focus and the power of getting into that flow state, it incredibly surprised me. I was shocked. Now, talking about the power of fo focus, Marty, I'm aware that you've got a new product that you're working on at the moment, literally been working on that today. Do you want to talk to the audience about what that is and when it should be available and, and where they might be able to catch you and that new product when it comes out? Jeez, I, don't, I, don't know, I don't know about the new, it's, it's a bit early. I feel like, uh, I feel like you know, Derek <laughs> Zoolander, you know, it's, I've, I've only been working on Magnum for 10 years. It's nowhere near ready enough. Uh, but, <laughs> but no, not, no, not like that. No, we've just been putting together some new online content that we're going to release in evergreen mode. And we're focusing now um, a little bit more, not just on leaders, but on leaders' career paths. And so mm. this, this one that we're just sort of wrapping at the moment is called Landing Your Dream Job, which will be available soon. But I think anyone who wants to know anything about me, it's really simple, martingmore.com. Right, that's it. Go to martingmore.com. You'll find pretty much everything you need to there. Subscribe to the podcast, No Bullshit Leadership, and you won't be able to escape me. Every time you log on to social media, my face will be there because the team does such an awesome job at, uh, at getting the content out there. So there's heaps and heaps and heaps and heaps of free content, um, hopefully high value because to improve the quality of leaders globally, we know that 99% of people who come into contact with our material are never going to spend a cent with us. 
we're fine with that. That's how the model yes. works. Um, but, you know, we've got a thriving business with the 1% that does. Yes, yeah, I totally agree with that and understand it too. And look, we know through Jack Zenger and, and Harvard Business Review that, that the average age of people getting leadership development has gone from 42 in 2012 to nearly 47 in 2021 when I reached out to Jack last year to just double check on, on if he'd updated that research. And most leaders are starting their formal leadership role in terms of their, their dream job and their dream leadership career job in their early 30s so that's that's up to 17 years nearly oh, yeah. of potentially yeah. messing with people's lives including their own life by not leading very well and that's why that one percent of folk that are engaging in your services marty are a smart folk because we need more leaders to actually know how to lead uh and to do it in a, in that strength while well, empathetic and hu humble way all in that continuum at the same time yeah, ab absolutely. Yeah, we're, we're, we're really happy with the amount of um, impact that we've been able to have already. But uh, when you set out to improve the quality of leaders globally, it is a big ask and uh, we're still going hard at it. We're, we're only just scratching the surface now, but we think we're starting to get good at it, Gary. So we'll just keep down this path. <laughs> I think you're going pretty well. Again, folks, no bullshit leadership. Definitely put that at the top of your next book list. Get it now, get it in Audible, get it on Kindle. Um, and certainly subscribe to the No Bullshit Leadership Podcast. On that note, this is Gary Ryan with the Moving Beyond Being Good Podcast. I thank you, Marty, for joining us today and giving us your precious time and helping get your message out to uh, a broader audience at least. Once again, folks, if you haven't subscribed to the Moving Beyond Being Good Podcast, please do ASAP, like and subscribe, and certainly go to orgsthatmatter.com forward slash newsletter to sign up for our newsletter. I look forward to working with you all next time. Thanks, Gary. It's been a pleasure.